my blessed pronounced Clodoardo Ragazzo from USP, Sao Paulo. He will speak about these coelastic types, models for use in celestial mechanics. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. What, such a nice, interesting, different conference. So, wow, I will talk about a very maybe different subject from all other subjects in this, in this conference, but it, nevertheless, it's a, well, it's a very diverse conference, so I feel very comfortable to talk about that. So this viscoelastic ties models for using celestial mechanics, and in fact, I did, even, uh, I did some change in my original planning. I will present this talk that's slightly more mathematical than the other one. And uh, so, but first of all, I have to tell my motivation for studying tides. And it's related to symplectic geometry in some sense. Because what I noticed, well, I was also, I used to work in mechanics, Hamiltonian dynamics, but not from a synthetic uh, point of view, synthetic geometry point of view. And then uh, well, I realized that we found too many periodic orbits. There are too many. There are so many that, you know, most of them probably Although they may play a, a role in a probabilistic way, even to describe you know, the dynamics, uh, but, uh, but there are too many. So, there should, I thought, there should be a way to select the interesting periodic orbits. One way is the, what you do, essentially, uh, variational methods, because with variational methods, you not only find the periodic orbit, but many times you, you find with some criteria. You minimize the action, for instance minimize the period. So you don't find any, any periodic orbit. As you, when you find a horseshoe in a dynamical system, right? So a horseshoe, you can prove the existence infinitely in many periodic orbits, large period anyway. So, but you find some periodic orbits with some properties. So there's this beautiful work by Hofer, for instance, one of these orbits that I find fantastic is this for convex uh, hypersurface, right? four dimensions, in other words, three-dimensional uh, dynamically convex uh, surface, you have this orbits that bind this open book that are normal surfaces of, of section. So these are very important periodic orbits, definitely, because they organize, in some sense, the, 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 the dynamics of, of the Hamiltonian system in this case. But I decided to, to look to, the, to another way to select periodic orbits, and, and that was through the physics. So the, the dissipation, because dissipation exists in this celestial mechanics problem, and, we, and many, it has many consequences in, in what we observe in our solar system, for instance. So I decided, let me look at dissipation. But from a mathematical point of view, dissipation is always put in the problem as something. Something, put there. Constant times velocity. So you get dissipation, that's it. But thinking about the Newtonian potential 1 over r squared, right? That's a force law, 1 over r squared. There are many force laws we can put in that equation. But these force laws, we are still discussing about it. Because it's not only, it's not any force law, it's a special one that gives a lot of mathematical, uh, interesting uh, mathematics. And even if they are not correct physically, you know, I bother, but you know, from the mathematical point of view, it's very interesting. So I thought maybe the dissipation, the dissipative force that comes directly from physics are the, the one we should look at, not only to put this KR dot in front of the... And so a long time ago, I started studying the problem of, of uh, not in celestial mechanics, it was not my goal, in fact, to, to get to the subject, it was an accident. But I started looking at uh, the motion of deformable bodies. Rigid bodies, you know, deformable, not rigid bodies, but deformable bodies, but almost rigid bodies. So I had the students that did, did his masters on this subject. And then eventually we realized, and I want to explain why, we, 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 from this problem we got into the, the problem of tides. And we started working on that. I, I, I've been working on this for, for many years now at least for six years. So, so this is the summary of my talk. So now I'm going to explain tides a little, uh, and then present to you 
the, the, the model we, we, we developed to, to study tides, is a ma from a mathematical point of view, is a very uh, nice model. From the physical point of view, from, the, from the, what people observe in reality, it's interesting, but of course, it has to be developed. I'm working on that. But anyway, so let me, let me show the mathematics. So this is a summary of my talk. Uh, so I talk a little about tides, the hypothesis of our models, and then this interesting part here, here about heology and dissipation of energy, etc. Anyway, that's the, the goal. So why do tides occur? Well, tides occur because Earth is not a point mass or orbit. So it's an extended object. So what happens? Uh, the gravitational force, with the Newtonian force, from a satellite acting on Earth, for instance. Uh, well, th there's an average force acting on Earth. If you subtract from this average force, what you can think is the force that acts on this, at the center of mass, the, the force that acts at each point of the body, we get this field here. So this field, what's this field? This field is the, is the, is the gravitational force at this point minus the average. Since the force decrease with distance, what happens? So you have an average force here, the force, the gravitational force is stronger here, and it's weaker here. So when you, when you subtract, you get this, 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 this field of differences of the real force from the average. And you see, this tries to, to deform the body in this way, the Earth in this way, and this is the reason that if the moon is here, then we have two high tides a day, because there's this rotating in this direction, and two low tides a day. Right? And it's important, this is also Newton, it's amazing, it was a, the great, one of the achievements of Newton, because people knew since ancient times that the moon, for instance, were related to tides. But no one could guess why there was two high tides. And, and Newton got, gave this explanation, the first one to give an explanation, why you have two high tides during a period of 24 hours, and not only one high tide. Anyway, but when you see this related with this, the property that the body is, the Earth is an extended body, not a point mass. Uh, now, tides from the point of view of celestial mechanics, because tides uh, is a deep subject. In fact, you can think about the Earth tides on the oceans, right? Uh, but the tide from the point of view of celestial mechanics is the tide of the whole planet. And essentially is, is how the gravitational field of the planet changes under some external force or under some spin. Also, you, the, the flattening of the body you know, also changes the gravitational field. So if the Earth were at rest, as he mentioned this morning, right, it would be spherical you know, without any other stars, etc. And, uh, but since it's rotating, there was a, also a force more or less like this, exactly this one, kind of a centrifugal force you know, compressed the body. So the Earth has a deformation, and it gets also a quadrupole moment. Of, of the, the, the gravitational uh, field of the Earth has a monopole component, which is nice, and a quadrupole component. So, so from the point of view of celestial mechanics, tides is this. You know, uh, the deformation of the gravitational field due to this, this interaction with other bodies, etc. Anyway, so, so touch on the point of the celestial mechanics. So there's not a point mass, but from a mathematical perspective, we would like it to be. Because if you, and this was the masters of my student, if you, if you start looking at rotating bodies as the Earth as an extended body, then you are out of the domain of ODs, ordinary differential equations. You are in the domain of PDs. Because you have to describe, you know, the deformation of each point of the Earth and the stress on each part. It's a highly complicated problem. You have to, if you want to do mathematics, you, want to, you have to define the, 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 the space of function you will work with to show that the existence of solutions, or at least try to understand how the solutions behave. So it's a complicated business. And, and when you do celestial mechanics, we treat the, 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 this planets and satellites, that's point masses. And this simplifies a lot, because you have systems of all these. So in other words, this, what I want to say, that I want to build a model where I, I do not, in fact, I still have point masses, but point masses with some structure. This was our 
competition in our goal. But and, and, and now comes some facts. So large celestial bodies are almost spherical symmetric due to gravity essentially. Large celestial bodies at least, not asteroids. The gravitational field have a large monopole component with the cable one over R, a much smaller quadrupole component with the cable as one over R cube, and even smaller multipole components. Right? But, uh, so you have the monopole component and the, and the quadrupole component and, and corrections. From the perspective of gravitational interaction of celestial bodies, uh, celestial bodies can be approximated by ellipsoid with the same moment of quadrupole tensor. In other words, if you neglect all these corrections, the multipole or, or octopole component of the gravitational field, you can replace the body by an ellipsoid, essentially, right. with the same uh, mass and the same uh, quadrupole component. Uh, and now, that's the reason that we started uh, looking at uh, the gravitational the tidal problem and not to only to isolated bodies. The moment of quadrupole tensor is equal to the traceless part of the moment of inertia tensor. So that's an important point uh, in this, this uh, talk because I said we started thinking about the uh, an isolated body rotating. That the important object is the moment of inertia. But when you start looking at the gravitational interaction between bodies, the important thing is the quadrupole tensor. And the quadrupole tensor is exactly the traceless part of the moment of inertia tensor. So rotation and gravitational interaction, they're related. Because the tensor that rules the interaction, gravitational interaction, is the quadrupole tensor, is essentially the same tensor that appears in the, in, the, in the moment of inertia, except for the trace. And then there is a result by George Darwin, in fact, the son of Charles Darwin, that if the body material is incompressible, then the trace of the moment of inertia is constant in time. And this, uh, this is the first order of flatness. It's a linear result. But anyway, everything we're going to use here is for a small, small, almost spherical body, so this result is correct. So if you have a sphere, you deform the sphere with an incompressible, uh, incompressible deformation, we always have this to, to force the order on the deformation. That the, 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 the trace of the of inertia is constant in time. So, and then we built our model based on the forming hypothesis. So when the body is at rest in a rotational motion, the distribution is nice, it's spherically symmetric. Notice, and this is important, spherically symmetric means the following. The density, uh, the internal density of the body and its geological properties can vary with the radius. But it's spherically symmetric. So you have the same density, for instance, in each shell, internal shell of the body, spherical internal shell. So, the second hypothesis, when the body has a rotational motion, then its distribution of mass is almost spherically symmetric. So we don't allow so fast rotation that the body becomes a, no, a very flat ellipsoid, because then we, 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 we have to take into account the octopole of, of the rotational field of the body. Uh, in the sense that the level sets of the, in other words, this is a, almost, uh, the bodies are ellipsoidal with small flattening. The body material has incompressible behavior and small deformations. This is also this is a natural hypothesis. Usually, this is okay for, for all bodies, including gaseous bodies. The body internal forces are such that, and this is important, the body internal forces are such that the motion preserves the total lunar momentum. Because this is something very interesting in, this, in all these constructions. Although energy is dissipated by tides, the angular momentum is not. Why it's not? <laughs> I don't know. But this is an axiom that's taken by everybody, and the physics can show, for instance, a star. The angular momentum of star can decrease only if the star loses masses. What happens? So, so, you have, so the angular momentum varies in a star only by losing mass. So it can eject mass. What happens with particles? So it's losing angular momentum because ejecting mass. But if, if you take away the, the ejection of mass, the angular momentum is constant. And more or less, this is related to the following. If you have a central force, you have central forces. The proof of the, of the, uh, that the angular momentum is preserved depending only 
on, on, the, on, this, on the forces, uh, no, to the, the central forces. So the, the forces align with the radius between the two forces, the, the two bodies. For instance, even if the force depends on, is a dissipative force, it, this holds, the conservation of angular momentum holds even for dissipative force, for force that depends on the velocity, for instance. So even if you have dissipation of energy, but you have the central forces, you do have conservation of angular momentum. So, and this is essentially a, 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 almost a microscopic, a hypothesis about microscopic forces between the, the agents, and, uh, adjacent, agents, and, agents and, uh, particles that are agents. Uh, and moreover, we now also need this hypothesis that the minimum distance between two bodies is sufficiently large that almost sphericity hypothesis still holds. In other words, we, we don't allow for, for 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 bodies that are not almost spheric. Anyway, but we are going to take this hypothesis more over. For real celestial systems, our solar system, for instance, these are all these hypotheses are okay, except if you take asteroids, that, then they can be they are not spherical. Some asteroids are not spherical, especially these small asteroids. So now let's do this um, let's see how, how we Built our model, right? And uh, we had a very tortuous, uh, I say, trajectory to, to get to this hypothesis, to this variable. But anyway, but after thinking for some time, we got to this. Well, we are going to construct a model for for bodies with a deformable bodies. So first, we are going to this to, to 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 set up the configuration space. So the position of the center of mass of each body, three positions for each body, an average orientation of the body, or a body frame with respect to which the moving shape of the body is defined, three dimensions, and that's the most subtle part, by far. Because the, the difficulty in, the, in, in doing this, uh, this model for everybody, not only for ourselves, is the following. When you have to describe the motion of a rigid body, there is no ambiguity in which is the body frame, the body that you, you, you choose to, do, to, to, to fix the frame. Because the, bodies, the body frame is the body where the geometry of the body, the, 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 the body is fixed. So you have the inertial frame and you have the body frame. If you have a deformable body, it's not easy to, 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 to in a, some sense, in a, to, to find a, a well-defined reference frame that follows the motion of the body. So here, this average orientation of the body is, is, is a reference frame that's called a Tissenhoff frame. The Tissenhoff frame is a frame with respect to which the angular moment of the body is nu. In other words, the body, take a rigid body, it's rotating, right? But then this body frame, you know, the Tissenhoff frame, is the frame in which the body is at rest. And this is a Tissenhoff frame. Why? Because the body is at rest with respect to this frame. So the angular moment of it is zero, trivial. This other frame is the following. The body is changing shape. So if you take two points of the body, they are rotating differently with respect to our to a inertial reference frame, the frame fixed on the, on the stars. But then you find a, a frame, a special frame, that is rotating, it's moving. But if you measure the velocity, of the particles with respect to the frame, the rotation of this particle with respect to this frame, the angular moment of this set of particles that define the body uh, is zero. And you can show that uh, this frame is unique up to rigid motions. You can define this frame uh, in a no ambiguous way. And then so you have, you have, we have a body frame attached to its body, which, which of these deformed bodies. And then we have uh, the shape part of the formation of infinite Well, in, in principle, the shape of the body has infinite dimensions, as I said, it's a PD problem. But we reduce the dimension of the deformation of variables from infinite to five. And here is the big you know, change. Uh, and why are the change in these five, uh, these five variables? Essentially, they are the components of the moment of inertia. Let me see if I have this. Uh, uh, 
No, I, I think I have this written. I mean, we'll just explain these five variables. Which are the five variables that we attach to the deformations? Anyway, well, the parameters are the mass. Well, and now comes the, the, the constant parameters. The mass, moment of inertia at rest, this I0, that's the traceless part of the, 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 the trace of the moment of inertia tensor, which is a constant. And then there are all the parameters. The heological, all, all these are heological parameters that they will discuss uh, further on. So let me explain how, how we do this. So first of all, in order to explain the model, I start with the rigid body model. So in the rigid body, I have a body frame, I have an inertial frame, and I have a way to describe the orientation of the body. It's this matrix that maps the, the body frame to the inertial frame. With this, uh, the configuration of the, of the rigid body changes with time, and I, using it, I can define the angular velocity operator, just this standard object here. I have the inertia matrix of the body, and define the, the, the is a rigid body, right? So the trace of the inertia matrix is this I0, and then I, I write the, the, the inertia matrix in this form, and, and then I write the, the gravitational field of the body. And the gravitational field, is, is written. This is the monopole part, this is the quadrupole part, and you see this matrix here, Q, that's, they are the, the, the quadrupole moment of the body, is essentially this B, but you know, this B divided with this normalization. B is, is a non dimensional matrix, and Q has dimensions of angular of moment of inertia, n times distance square. Uh, well, and then we and then we we, 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 we construct our our this is still rigid body, right? So how do I, I define the I construct the Lagrangian for a rigid body? This is the only the kinetic energy of the body. If I you know from this Lagrangian I can write the equation of motion. This is the equation of the, for a rigid body. So you see, uh, Euler's equation, angular momentum, etc. It's a, it's a a way to write Euler's equation in a matrix form. This is all, uh, all matrices, B, etc. B is a constant here. Right? So what do we do in the other model? Parameterization of the deformation. So here, B is a constant, because the moment of inertia is constant. What you're going to do now is the following, it's to parameterize the deformation. So first of all, the incompressibility that Darwin uh, theorem implies that the, the trace of the moment of inertia is constant in time. So this does not change times a parameter fixed parameter. And we impose the degrees of freedom of the deformation are those of B. In other words, in our Lagrangian, we have, this is a, the, the rigid body Lagrangian, but now B is not anymore constant. B is a, is a, can vary with time. And this was our first guess for the, for the dynamics of B. So B is a deformation, and I just, we just postulate that B Satisfies this this Lagrangian. More of this a norm in the matrix norm is the norm of a matrix is just b times the, the matrix times its transpose. Uh, so this b squared is b. The trace of the b times its transpose, and then uh, and moreover. So this is our Lagrangian, and from this Lagrangian we derive the equations of motion. The equations of motion for a single the formable body under this model is essentially this. You have, again, conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is given by this. And this is the equation for, for the, the formable bodies. And this, if you, you can see, this is a harmonic oscillator equation for the, the formable body. And moreover, this, I think, is the good part to, to, to just to, to explain. So this is our idea. We construct a Lagrangian. Uh, Take the rigid body Lagrangian and add to the rigid body Lagrangian a, 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 another term for the moment of inertia matrix. In other words, our idea was to construct a Lagrangian for the degrees of freedom of the deformation, and for us, the degrees of freedom of the deformation are the components of the inertia tensor. That's it. We have to add the dissipation. Dissipation was added. Uh, by means of this dissipation function, really dissipation function, so very standard thing. So we have essentially all the Lagrangian equations with dissipation function, and you get our model. So if you, if you add dissipation function, the harmonic oscillator equation for the for the inertia tensor becomes a dumped harmonic oscillator for the inertia tensor. 
So this, this is a nice mathematical model, by the way, for a single body with, uh, with deformable body. And moreover, if you, if, you, if you study the dynamics of this, we get what people get, everybody gets. That we start with a body, uh, and then you put it rotating, and then uh, it will do some motion, dissipates energy. At the end, it will spin steadily along its, uh, the axis of largest moment of inertia. Well, like, no, this is a very standard uh, result. So it's uh, qualitative and gives the, the correct result for the, the spinning of the, the formal body, the asymptotic spin of, an, uh, the asymptotic spin of, 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 a, of a deformable body with dissipation. So at least qualitatively, it's OK. But now comes the, this, uh, we did very quickly this. I, sa I, started, I, sta I started working on this in 2014. 2015, we were more or less at this point. That was an easy part. It was almost pure mathematics, except for the, 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 the T7 frame. It was an old 19th century idea of T7. But then we submit a paper, well, we submit a paper with this body rear rotating, it was OK, and you will accept it. But then we did the mistake, or I would say, we tried to apply to the Earth. And we submitted a paper applying to the Earth and trying to, to, to get the figures of the, the numbers that people measure for the Earth. We did not get the correct numbers, but we are mathematicians, we don't care about numbers. <laughs> we just said, no, this is a simplified model, but it's nice because although we don't get the correct numbers, we get uh, part of them correctly. We, we did good. And the guy rejected the paper. But the direct said, well, here we do not accept papers unrelated to what's going on. And the Earth does not follow this har harmonic oscillator equation. The heology, the first time I think I, I listened to this word, heology was in that referee report. The heology of the Earth is not a uh, uh, Kelvin void heology. So I, I decided to read what was Kelvin void heology into the song because for me only the harmonic oscillator exists. And then this really uh, changed my life because th then I spent a lot of time studying all the, this business about heologies. And in fact, I'm still doing that. So, so and then comes this curious thing. When people talk about heology, do you know what heology is? No, so no, let me tell you what heology is. Heology is, is the way. The, 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 the a material, uh, uh, the, the reaction of material to external, external forces. In other words, take a, a spring, right? We know F equals Kx, right? So you apply a force, it just do a linear displacement with respect to the, to the displacement is proportional to the force. Okay. Moreover, if to take now an oscillating force, no mass, so just a spring, right? If you put an oscillating force, cosine of omega t, the displacement is k times cosine of omega t. But if you take a real material, more boys, if you take steel, it really behaves like that. So let me show now how, how do people do experiments with heology and define a heology of a material. They take a sample of material, three centimeters wide, a cylinder, and they glue two, plate, two steel plates, one on the top, the other on the bottom. The bottom plate they put in a machine and, and this, this, uh, this, this steel plate on the, on the bottom part, it stays fixed, it stays fixed, but it's, it's linked to a, to a machine that measures force. It's fixed, but you are going, they will be able to measure the force that acts on this sample. And the upper part, they shake harmonically, sinusoidal shake, including, you can see in the internet, the machine working, it's a very interesting, there is a wheel, and, and so what they do? So they prescribe the displacement on the top part, right? And they can turn here, they can gauge the, the, the frequency of, of this motion. And at the, at the bottom, they measure the force. So is it? And this to, to, to this, with this machine that does this, they get the shear modules of the material. It's the shear, uh, how it responds to the shear stresses. So what happens? When they do this experiment, what they realize? They realize that the response of the machine, for instance, if you have a, a spring like steel, right? What the, the, the answer is exactly what I, I said. It's just, you know, you have a constant. You put a force, a uh, displacement here, the force is, pro is, is proportional to the, the force. To, to, this, this force is proportional to the displacement, that's it. 
But if you have, for instance, dissipation, you have a, a phase shift on this. So you have a, the, the response of the forces is slightly delayed to the, to the, to the, to the displacement of, of the sample, the upper displacement of the sample. In other words, what they realized is that the, 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 the response of the, of the sample, material samples, are similar to the response of this simple spring dash pot systems. So, so they get from this machine, they get a, a curve, essentially a curve like this. So they have here a, a omega. And then they have a, 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 I just write here, x equals k omega. F, f of omega. This is a constant, so the force here is this. And here you have this also, if you want. And this k omega is a, is a complex number. As a real imaginary part. But if you plot, for instance, the real part of k, you get a curve like this, for instance. Right? Or then you plot, you, plot, you plot the imaginary part, you get a curve. So other type of curve. But anyway, but they, they, they compare this curve that they measure with curves, uh, response curves of these objects here, these spring dashboard systems. And they realize they are similar. So they classify the, this rheology using these spring mass systems. So this one is the left, is this maxo, uh, a body with maxo rheology has this spring mass system here. The one is Kelvin Voigt is this, is the harmonic oscillator. Here you have burgers, here you have so many different uh, rheologies. Like what, 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 what is that? that so, that, so there's a spring and what is it underneath? A dash pot. Dash pot is a dumper. The spot is, is an is a element that reacts. Is it like a, a current for it? It's a negative pole. Or positive Let's pole call this. The that, that's the, the reaction of the dash spot. A force is proportional to velocity. And moreover, you see, this is interesting because more or less, have you heard about this glass behaving like a fluid? Glass is a very solid stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But more or less is this situation. Because you see, what happens with this? If you apply a, an oscillating force here, this behaves more or less like a, a spring. Because you know, this, it is very fast. The velocity is so fast here that this very, the, 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 the dumper almost does not displace. But if you put a, just a static force here, very, so it, this, the, the spring remains at rest more or less, it deforms a little bit, remains at rest. And then this dash pot starts, you know, flowing. So more or less, this is the idea of this uh, the glass. So if you if you put a static force, you know, it has also this dumper, very strong dumper, but it's a very slow motion. You know, it, it flows steadily, you know, and then like a fluid. So this more or less, a, 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 if you have a static force, this element behaves like a fluid with some viscosity. And, but if you have a, a oscillating force, it behaves like a, a, a spring. And the Earth behaves like that. The Earth, if, when you compute the flattening of the Earth, you get the result because it's a static force. But if you take the tides induced by the, by the moon, the rigidity of the Earth, it's, uh, the Earth is three times more rigid for the tidal force of the moon, for instance, in, the, in that frequency, the journal frequency, semi-journal frequency than it is to the, to the flattening of the centrifugal force, the steady rotation. Because steady rotation, it's rotation steadily, is a force with frequency zero, that's a steady force. But the tidal not, the tidal is a force that varies every 12 hours, right? so it's a different uh, period. So, so you have to take into account this rheology. And now comes, in fact, my, my greatest contribution to the field, because I and this student, we came up with this association principle that's uh, based on some, uh, also some continuum mechanics, but it's a continuum mechanics that we, we put in this big context of, of, of celestial bodies. And it's called association principle, which is based on, on isotropy and compressibility. So we consider quadratic functions on B, tensor, right? And then, uh, and then if you have this tensor, and use the properties that BIJ is a symmetric matrix and traceless, you get that, you know, there, there must be only, this tensor must be a multiple of a single tensor. Uh, this is a standard, in fact, uh, 
reasoning that we do in continuum mechanics, particularly in hydrodynamics of, of Newtonian fluids. And then, uh, and then we got to this association principle that means the following. You take the Lagrangian of a, a spring mass system, like this, this one. You write the Lagrangian dissipation function. And to get the Lagrangian dissipation function for the real body, for the, the, the celestial body, you just replace the x by the d. And there is a justification in terms of symmetry, isotropy of space, and, 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 and that's it. And here you use heavily that the body is spherically symmetric. Because if the body is not spherically symmetric, then this result is not true. You have to modify it. Because this, the appearance of a single, some single parameters here, this mu, this gamma, this uh, scalar parameters here, is related to this isotropy of, of uh, the, 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 spheric, the body being spherically symmetric at rest. Anyway, but we, divide, we have this now, we have this way to describe the, the heology, and then using this heology, Vichet heology, we could publish the paper by the, uh, about the Earth. We cannot fit all the data for the Earth, but we, f we fit much more data. And the guy, I don't know if the same guy, the, the same journal, was happy with this new result. And in fact, that was really uh, something new. Because uh, after this paper, we, we start interacting with many people. Now, and, and some of them are using our model. To, to do this uh, modeling of, of tides because it's simple and it's uh, clean and easy to use. So, and moreover, well, let's just show the equation of motion because this is not going to. Uh, my, my, my talk finished at 4, right? 4 5. So four, minute, 4 hours and 5 minutes. So, so I have to give an idea what I get from these equations. Yeah, about five minutes only. Yeah. Ten minutes. I don't want to bother you that much with this. <laughs> anyway, if you look, let's look at that. So what, what I have here? Here I have more or less the equations that uh, I talked about. What are those equations? If you if you just erase this, you have the, the, the point masses. Okay. Now suppose that B is constant, and we take into now you take B B dot equals zero. Suppose B is constant. So this equation goes away. B dot is constant. This equation goes away. This is a, you see B dot. This is equation. This is the, due to the deformation part, the heology. But suppose B is constant. If B is constant, this goes away because here you have, uh, let me see, where is B? Oh, uh, U, U is not written here, but U is B dot. Yeah, U is B dot. It's not written here. It's wrong. But U is B dot, so U goes away. But B is constant here. Uh, anyway, if B is constant, you get only this, this, this equation. This equation is just the rotation of the body. And this equation. So, so this models what? This models a system of rigid bodies. So now you don't have point mass, but you have rigid bodies. And moreover, what you do you take into account? If the bodies were spherical, then this would also vanish because then you Simple operation shows that this part vanishes. But if the body are ellipsoids, for instance, this part does not vanish. What they describe? They describe this 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 quadrupole moment of this rigid body. So if if, if if B is constant, this this set of equations describe the motion of a system of n rigid bodies with some flatness, so some moment of inertia. Moreover, you see now we have to describe also the rotation. Because the gravitational interaction depends on the orientation of the body. Because if you have an elongated body, two elongated bodies, if this body is oriented this way or that way, the gravitational field is different. Because it's not symmetric anymore. It's not a sphere anymore. So, so this is the... But if you put this B different from zero, this is the part of the heology. It's how the, the, the body is deformed under external force. So you see. This part, this omega here, is the centrifugal force that flattens the body due to the rotation. And this part is the tidal part. It's the it causes the deformation of tidal interactions of the body. So this is the tidal force. This is the centrifugal force. This is the deformation. And this lambda here is something that comes from the heology. If you, if you complicate the heology, you put more of this internal degrees of freedom in the body. You can put, in fact, very complicated heology. The last paper I published that I, I would talk here, but it, that, that was even more technical from the heology part of view, was a, by a paper with the Andrade heology. 
the Andrade horology is something, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a, a horology with memory in time. It's more or less like a delay equation because the, here, you see, the, the, the formation of the body depends only on the instantaneous force of the body. But when you have the Andrade horology, the, the formation of the body depends on the whole history of the force. It's, it's, uh, so, so, so it's not that easy to do the modeling. So we could do, using this association principle, for the first time, a time uh, integration with, uh, with the Andrade Heology with, with some people, uh, with, with some astronomers that were interested in the Andrade Heology, of course. Well, then there's parameters I'm not going to talk about the Earth. This is what we got correctly for the Earth, right? And conclusions and remarks. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm doing propaganda of my own work. <laughs> <laughs> time response and time domain, frequency domain, or this is something I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to just to talk about another thing that just have to change the slide here. Uh, I want, I'm going to talk only about one thing about this syllabus that I think is, is, is interesting. Uh, so let me do this. Uh, what, what, what do I have to do here? I have to, yes, I have to come to the other. When we come to 2000, control L. Yes. So let's just, this is more or less, you see, not different. This from, uh, that, that, this is interesting from, from the general audience. Some effects of tidal force on the Earth's moon system. Let's take a look at that. This has uh, some interesting detail. The moon is tidal locked to the Earth, namely, one side of the moon always faces the Earth. Everybody knows that, right? But this effect of tides, effect of tides. All major satellites in the solar system have the same situation. All of them, the major, not the small satellites. The rate of dissipation of tidal energy in the Earth, this is what we get with that uh, model, is 3.66 terawatts. And more or less, this is funny because the Earth gets 10,000 more energy from the sun every day. So you see, it's a dissipation of energy by tides is 10,000 more than the energy we get from the sun. Nevertheless, it's not negligible. It's important for the satellite to go ahead. What happens to that energy? I'm sorry? What happens it, to that? It becomes heat. Ah. For instance, let me tell you why we, we, we did this, this simulation with, with Andrade Heology for Enceladus. This is the reason people are interested. Enceladus has a subsurface ocean, so it has liquid water. Enceladus is a, is a satellite of Saturn. It may have life inside. This is the reason people are so interested in all these satellites with subsurface oceans. And the energy on the satellites almost surely is from tides. Because, you know, they, they are very far from the sun, but they are close to these giant planets, either Saturn or, or Jupiter. So, and they have more eccentric orbits many times. So there are strong tides on them, and, the, and this energy then is responsible for, for giving heat to the planet. So if there is some life in this planet, it's due to the existence of uh, energy displayed by tides. But then the Earth is not so, so much. And moreover, one, one really interesting thing, when I read this for the first time, this is a, a, a figure that people work at a lot on this, to, to this geophysicists to, to get this figure more or less correct. See, there was an agreement about this figure around the, the year 2000. And by that time, that was the power, <coughs> the, the, the same po power that we generated, uh, with the, 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 the same power that human beings generate with electricity, electri electric power. Not, not using uh, the power that we spend in cars, etc. Only electric power, uh, the electric power plant of the Earth had more or less in the year 2000 the same and generating figures. And this shows how human beings are changing the planet because if we generate the same amount of electricity, then the tides dissipate uh, on Earth. 10,000 less than we get from the sun. But then, then you see, our figures are really impressive, the human being mm -hmm. figures. So probably we generate much more electricity now. So we, we dissipate more energy at Earth than the tides. And uh, Earth rotation is going down. They increase about 1.7 milliseconds per century. So you see, <laughs> days are getting longer. And the Earth's moon distance is increasing. They can measure this with using laser and mirrors. 3.8 centimeters per year. But the total moon will be to this constant. So it's, uh, 
So this is a, this is a all his cellars. You know, to describe the geometry of his cellars. This is also the uh, the same thing I said before. It's uh, let me go to the to the cellars. Uh, results for the elevation of cellars. Several results, but you know the result that is interesting is this one. We did some computations using parameters that other people used use this uh, Andrade geology. Uh, people use the Andrade geology in the frequency domain bef before us, because uh, this is a classical subject, but we, we did a simulation in the time domain, and it was the first time we, uh, someone did that. This is the reason that this paper, I like this paper. But anyway, but what I most like it is this longer result. The observed magnitude of our measure of is 0 0.21, so radians. Our value with geological plans from the literature is 0 0.00058. What, what's this like bridge? Enceladus, the satellite, has a rotation. But since the orbit is eccentric, it also has a libration. In other words, it's like the moon. The moon is looking to the Earth, but it has a, a small angular velocity, right? So it's, it's phase locked, but you know, you can see slightly one face of the moon because it uh, has a small libration. And, and astronomers look at this libration very carefully because it's related to the internal structure of the body. So there was Cassini, this, this uh, spacecraft, measured the amplitude of the libration of his cells and got this figure. This, the, the, the libration angle, it, it changes a little from the mean, from, uh, for, it rotates more or less steadily with a, with, a, with a constant angular velocity, but it has a small libration with this amplitude. And our model gets a, 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 a libration amplitude, that's that. In principle, I am collaborating with other people here. Let me just give the name here. Uh, what is the name of the people? It's important to give the name, right? Here, this is the paper of people. This is a student of mine. She's finished her PhD. This is a, a guy in the uh, Observatory of Paris. Lucas Luiz is a former student of mine. And Alexandre Correa is an astronomer in Coimbra. So when we got to this, uh, we saw it's wrong. The model is wrong. But anyway, again, we can always say well, our model is so simple that uh, that uh, we're not going to get that. But then we thought a little bit more, and then we asked ourselves, should we get the same figure as they got? And the answer is no, we should not get. And the reason is the following. And this I'm going to, I'm going to I'm discussing this only to tell you about this, uh, this result. Maybe have a few minutes better. Why do we not get the same result? Because the frame of reference that we are using is this Tisserand frame. And this Tisserand frame is an abstract frame. It's a, a frame constructed by mathematicians, not by a physicist. So what it follows? It follows the angular moment of the body. So with respect to this frame, the angular moment of the body is known. So let's take the Earth. The Earth, people like a reference frame that fix the latitude and longitude of Sao Paulo, for instance, right? Campinas. Know where we are. The distant frame is a sort of moving frame because it follows the angular momentum. So if there is a strong wind, wind, a strong wind right, in some direction, it carries angular momentum. So the frame moves a little with the wind. Of course, the air is so light that compares, compared to the angular momentum of the whole Earth, it's minimal. But anyway, it moves a little, right? So the criticism about this model from the astronomers, they thought, well. OK, you are describing the dynamics of some frame orientation that we never know where it is, because it, it's following the angular momentum of the, of the body, the average angular momentum. But in this case, it was very interesting, because uh, we know that this, this, this satellite has a subsurface ocean, some observations independent of that. So what we did, we used our, our angular our, or I say, say, our amplitude of vibration to estimate. Because what is the model for this planet? This is the model for itself. The current model for internal model for itself is the following. Here's an ice shell that's 23 kilometers thick. They have a subsurface ocean that's 28 kilometers thick. And there is a core, uh, inner core, which is solid, mixture of some rocks and, and ice. And everything has to add more or less 250 kilometers. That's the radius of, of so this, uh, the thickest part is, this, is the core. 
So what's going on here? We have a libration of the shell. The liquid part almost do not liberate. And we have a small libration of, the, of, the, of the, the core. And the angular momentum has a libration that is smaller than the libration of the, of the, of the, of the shell. And what we are measuring in our, in our model is the, is the libration of this, this uh, frame, that the average the, the frame, that's, this distance frame, that's more or less is, is, follows the average angular moment of the body. So essentially, using this idea, we could, in fact, explain, we could estimate, in fact, the amplitude of vibration of the core. It's very small. The core is almost at rest. But what really vibrates in the cell is, is, is the shell. Uh, the rest is almost uh, at rest. So the vibration is concentrated on this part. So I like it this because it shows uh, that this frame of reference, the rotation part, that's the complicated part in this whole issue, uh, has a meaning that although you cannot follow it, uh, because it's complicated to, to know, we, we can integrate the model, but, but to compare with the reality is not easy. But at least you can get some, uh, some uh, consequence of this. And the conclusion of this, so we are able to compute the evolution time domain of the Sandrati geology. Uh, libration and tides are coupled and so simultaneously in the time domain. This is a point that related to the frequency domain. And, and different parts of the form may rotate and vibrate differently. And this is always true. In our model, we follow the vibration of a reference frame Tisserin in which the body and moment is due. And in this case, it was useful because it allowed us to estimate the vibration of, of the internal degree of freedom. And, uh, and that's it, I think. I think so. it's enough. Of course, a, a model. Right? We know. We know from observation um, that the shell vibrates. Yeah, okay. The shell is So we know we see some angle of vibration here. And then we have a model, but in our model, is, is, it's you have the torque. You have a torque that is the same torque people use, and this is essentially DDT. I, I'm sorry, this is the moment of inertia of the body. But this body is not a rigid body. So what happens here is the following. The shell has a, 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 a moment of inertia. The ocean has another moment of inertia. And the core has another moment of inertia. We know this moment of inertia because we have a model that gives the thickness of these three layers and the mass of these three layers. So we can compute the, 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 the angular moment. And so we assume that, in fact, you have three omegas. You have omega for the shell, omega is the angular velocity, right? Omega for the core, I'm sorry, the ocean, and omega for the core. Omega for the, and omega is this omega, is only the omega of vibration. You, you also have a uniform rotation that we can take away. So we suppose, in fact, there are lots of reports that omega of vibration of the shell, the, the ocean is zero. Omega of vibration of the shell, we know, mm -hmm. observation. And then the only unknown is the omega of vibration of the of the of the, the, the core. Since we know the moments of inertia, we plug into this equation and we get this uh, because we, we know what, what should be the, 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 the we should we know from the model what should be the, the, the integral, the, the sum of the three. Mm -hmm. This this is what I mean. It's, it's more or less more or less the explanation. We, so we have we, we can get an integral quantity in our model. Mm -hmm. We cannot distinguish between you know, the angular moment of the different parts. Yeah. But in this simple case, we have only three parts. Yeah. You measure one, the other one will assume it's zero, that's the liquid. Yeah. It's reasonable. Yeah. And we can estimate the, the, the one in the core. So we cannot, in, we have to use the model of these people here. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, because otherwise we could not uh, guess yeah. this. But anyway, but it's uh, what, what I want to, to mention that we, we are forming the average angular moment of the body, the form of the body. So that, there are two contributions we, we gave in the subject, I think. Well, one is not our contribution. This is a frame. It's a very old stuff. But this is more or less an abstract construction. It's uh, people, the astronomers, like and don't like. This is a frame is amazing because you see another two, two other characterizations that they, they had in, from the 19th century. You take a deformable body. 
So what's the deformed body? It's a bunch of particles, each one moving in one direction. So it's, a, it's a crazy stuff, right? Then you, you, you instantaneously, you, you take the form, you take a, 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 you have reference frames, orthogonal frames, right? And you put it rotating, are sent, you, you fix the center of mass of the system, and you put body, uh, this, this frame rotate, rotating instantaneously. When you compute the angular momentum, you have to subtract the, the velocity of the particle from the velocity of the, the frame. So this distance frame is the one that minimizes the kinetic energy of the system. In other words, if you compute the kinetic energy with respect to the system, the if you compute the velocity of this, the particles with respect to this moving frame, the distance frame is the one that minimizes the kinetic energy. It's at least square <laughs> computation. And also, now when you compute this, this minimization, you What's the, 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 the solution of this least square system? Is the, is the one that also makes the angular momentum zero with respect to it. So it's a very nice frame. The point is, as I said, uh, if you have the wind, you know, strong wind in one direction, uh, since it's taking the whole angular momentum of the Earth, the frame moves a little, right? Because it's uh, following the, 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 the motion of the particles. So, so, so it's not fixed to Sao Paulo, the one of the accidents, it's not fixed to Sao Paulo. Because it's, the Earth is, is moving, right? And the wind is part of the Earth for, for us. We're not looking at the solid Earth or the seas. We're looking to everything, the, the distribution mass of the, of the So this was not our contribution. And the, our, really, our contribution to this and what makes us collaborating with other people is this association principle. That, that was really our, our idea uh, due to this Earth failure that we had in other people. Anyway, that's quite good. Thank you for the question. Okay, any further questions? Then let's take our speaker.